Hi, this is Larry Mantle. It's time to get your tickets to the 21st Annual Film Week Academy Awards preview with all of our critics in attendance. Sunday afternoon, March 5th, Orpheum Theater, downtown L.A. Tickets at las.com slash events. L.A.S. Studios. If you're like a lot of people I know, you just use half of your paycheck toward your gas bill. My name is Ruth Kalichman. My gas bill for January was $782. And typically I would say around this time, it's usually like around $300 or $350. This is Sharon McNary. A year ago in January, my gas bill was $127. This January, it was $356, even though I used less gas. My name is Carlo Giovanni. My gas bill is usually $150, but last month it went up to $479, taking into consideration that it's just me and my dog in my apartment. My name is Taylor. I live in Santa Monica. I have such a high gas bill this month. It's almost $300. It's really tricky because our apartment gets very, very cold and we have a baby, so we can't not use the heat. From Elias Studios, I'm Brian De Los Santos, and this is How to LA. The price to heat your home has been kind of out of control, like three times what people typically pay each month. The thing is... The gas price spike is actually a California thing. Costs are actually down in other parts of the country. Now, the good news is, in case you missed it, the price spike is expected to fall. Your next energy bill won't be nearly as pricey as this last one. The expectation in February, and they've already locked in these prices, those prices are going to come down quite a bit. But prices are still well above what they were last year. I don't know about y'all, but that money spent on heating lately could have been used on a whole lot of other things in my world, like Beyonce tickets. (laughs) So we wanted to understand, why has it been so high? And is that going to be the norm come every winter in California? Let's break it down with William Boyd from UCLA's Institute of Environment and Sustainability. He's going to give us an expert lowdown. Hey, William. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Great. Thanks for being here. So I know it was extra cold, but how much does the weather actually affect our gas bills? So the cool, wet weather that we've had so far this winter in California has definitely had an impact on our gas bills. But I think we need to put that in the broader context of what's going on in the national natural gas market. Obviously, one of the big factors that has affected natural gas prices over the last 18 months or so is the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has created all kinds of constraints for the European Union, the member countries there, many of which were heavily dependent on Russian natural gas. And so they've had to go find new gas supplies and they've looked to the United States. And so there's been a lot of liquefied natural gas being exported from the United States to make up the difference. That has created some pressures in the domestic natural gas market, but in general, prices in the United States are back down to where they were before the invasion. But the prices vary quite a bit across the country, and California is sort of at the end of the line, if you will. There have been some pipeline constraints. There are some storage issues. Um, There are some issues going on with the electric power sector. All of those together have created additional pressures on natural gas and getting natural gas to California to provide the additional gas needed for heating this winter. And I read somewhere that a pipeline issue in Texas is affecting what we pay for gas here in Los Angeles County. Why doesn't it hit other states as much? Most of our gas here in California is coming from the Permian Basin in Texas, and some's coming from Colorado, but it's coming from out of state. And to move natural gas, obviously, you need to ship it through pipelines. It's somewhat expensive to transport it. It's about 20 times more expensive to transport natural gas than it is to transport oil, for example. So when you have pipeline capacity problems and constraints on the ability of the pipelines to move gas from the supply regions, from the gas fields in Texas to California, that obviously then cuts back on the amount of supply that's available to provide 
the needs for the demand of the retail customers. And so the, there's a particular set of pipelines coming from Texas that have had some constraints and some capacity issues, and that has contributed to the big surge in prices that we've seen in January. Now we know from SoCal Gas that prices will be dropping by a lot. I mean, that's kind of quick. Do you know exactly what happened there? What happens is that SoCal Gas, San Diego Gas and Electric, PG&E, the big sort of retail gas suppliers in California, they're typically buying gas on monthly contracts that have a pricing term in those contracts where the prices are tied to an index of gas trades. And those indexes change month to month depending on the relative availability of gas. And so that goes back to the general state of the natural gas markets. Traders, people are, that are buying and selling gas are looking around the country. They're looking at the Russian invasion of Ukraine. They're looking at the additional demand from European countries. They're looking at a cold, wet winter. They're looking at less hydropower coming down from the Northwest to California, which then requires more natural gas generation in California. All of that together in addition to relatively low storage, are creating kind of constraints. And I think that's what drove the big run-up in prices. Some of that has subsided now, and I think now you see prices going back down. I'm curious if there's any way that the governor or local Congress people can affect change here. Because <laughs> if, if the international affairs are impacting states as ours, is there any way that the markets can change with some regulations? Longer term, I think the solution is electrification and then working hard to make sure that electricity prices are stable and affordable. And so as we decarbonize the power sector and as we electrify heating and cooking and transportation, electrification becomes really the dominant climate strategy in California. There's a way in which that could provide a lot more stability in terms of you know utility bills, but that really depends on how the Public Utilities Commission decides to design the rates for electricity. So I want to turn to you and ask you your expert tip or trick to when these high prices have come through your bill, what do you usually do? Are you preparing yourself? There's not a lot you can do to reduce your demand for natural gas for cooking and heating. You can certainly turn your thermostat down, but how far down do you want to go and how cold do you want to be? So the bigger issue here is we, the public, need to think long and hard about how those necessities are being provided and how they're being priced. And it strikes me that we should be working with our public utility commissions, our legislators, the governor and others to come up with better ways to price energy across the year so that we don't face bills in January that are 380 percent of what they were the year before or even a few months before. Economists would say that the demand for natural gas and electricity, it's very inelastic. It doesn't respond a lot to price increases because this is a necessity. So sure, there's investments we can make with weatherization and we can wear more sweaters and we can do all of that. But in the long run, people don't want to make massive adjustments in their demand for something that is a necessity like energy. So to recap, folks, the cold, wet weather we've experienced lately does have some impact, but these price hikes are mostly due to national and international systems that are a little bit complicated. The Russian invasion of Ukraine last year created supply issues in the EU, where a lot of countries are dependent on Russian natural gas. That led to the huge spike in gas prices we all saw at the pump throughout the year. Now, those numbers have almost leveled out, but constraints and capacity issues from the gas fields in Texas put pressure on national gas supply, which we saw reflected in January's bill. Now, we have confirmed that gas prices in February are going to be a lot lower. But gas prices will remain volatile moving forward. And as William said, basically only the government can step in here to mitigate and stabilize costs for consumers. But as a person who rents, I really want to know how to spend way less on heat with or without a price hike. LA's reporter Kaylin Hernandez researched some tips on how to stay warm inside your homes. And I'm here for all this. Hey, Caitlin. Hi. So everyone is talking about the gas bill. 
you delved into the story and you researched some tips. What are some things that you learned? You know, I think it's important to talk about this realistically. It's been cold. And so we're going to be using heaters, even though it's like expensive. So just figuring out how to use that smartly, I think, is important. For example, you could only use your heating equipment later in the day. You can, you know, adjust the thermostat. There are also like free things you can do to kind of like keep your home warmer. You can open up your windows during the day and let the sunlight in. And then during the night, you'd close it because it blocks out like that cold draft that your windows can get. That's like some small things you can look out for, especially if you have like hardwood floors that can crack up or like your baseboards. All of that can contribute to what's called leak heat. You know, you can honestly just grab a little caulking stick that you get from Home Depot or something mm. and just go along those baseboards and look for little gaps, look for holes. And that will really make a difference in the long run. I'm not such of a handy person, but, you know, if I got to protect the heat, I will do that, honey, because it gets cold in some of these apartments. And you also reported that you can use your fan to maybe maximize the heat inside of the home, too. Yes, it probably sounds really counterintuitive. And when I looked it up, I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. When I was young, my family's home had like a whole house fan, which is like those big industrial fans that are up in like the ceiling. And when it would get cold outside, we would turn it the other direction because it had that function. And it would pretty much would like suck up the cold air and like help disperse the hot air that was in the house because hot air rises. Mm -hmm. So if you're a ceiling fan, if you have one, if you can change the direction, you should make it spin clockwise. And that'll create like an updraft to circulate that warm air. I also wanted to ask you about people who are renting, right? Not everyone owns a property here in L.A. because it's expensive. Do you know if landlords can take care of any of this stuff? I always recommend before you do anything to your apartment like that you should ask your landlord first. I think when it comes to these little fixes, it might not be a big deal if you're like caulking, for example. But if you're going to be making like any other big adjustments, like weather stripping your windows, things that are going to be an investment, not only is it just good to make sure your landlord's aware of it, but you also maybe don't need to be fronting the money to do that because you don't own the space. So it's good to just be like, hey, can I get reimbursed with this? You know, can I get something knocked off of my like rent amount for that month? They might even, you know, be great and have a handyman come in to do it. And one more thing that people should be aware of is that if you have SoCal Gas as your utility provider, they actually have a program called Level Pay Plan, and you can kind of use that to smooth out the ups and downs of your bill throughout the year. So what they'll do is they'll kind of average out your past history use and like the projected annual cost that they do for gas, and you'll pay that amount instead of your actual usage throughout the year. I love that tip. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank you. Alrighty, y'all. Hopefully all this was helpful for you and maybe you start caulking those windows. <laughs> also to note, California's Public Utilities Commission is issuing credits to offset these natural gas bills. So some Angelinos might be getting some relief. Special thanks to Elias, Kaylin Hernandez, and William Void from UCLA. We got a link to that story from Caitlin in our show notes and we'll have it online at elias.com slash howtola. You can subscribe to the podcast and our newsletter there, too. We'll catch you tomorrow. Hasta luego. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. What if California seceded from the United States? Back in 2014, two guys decided they were going to try to find out. Louis Marinelli and Marcus Ruiz Evans founded a movement known as Cal Exit. And what happened next was something I don't think anybody would have predicted. My phone is ringing off the hook. We had 40,000 people on board in about a week. It was reporters, it was people sending messages of support. He informed me that he was moving to Moscow. I just took the money. And I was starting to lose my mind. Power and possessions and pleasure. I don't know that he's a trustworthy character. I mean, the biggest mistake I ever made was meeting with at all. He was taking orders from the FSB with the intended purpose of destroying America. This is The Last Resort, a documentary podcast about the rise, fall, and rebirth of Cal Exit. 
It's a story that will take us from a conspiracy in Los Angeles in the early 1910s. They bought up land cheap that they later sold for millions. To a fight for power in California's far north. This is a complete, unequivocal overthrow of the government. And all the way to Russia. The guy who's leading the California independence movement is sitting in Moscow next to this guy who we know is funded by the Kremlin. There are double standards in USA and as a result... A criminal case was opened. I'm Shoot Scott, and from Interval Presents and Awfully Nice, this is The Last Resort. All episodes now streaming on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. When we started in 2014, people laughed at us. No one's laughing anymore. Uh,